Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another show of Cage Talk. Today, my special guest, we have a UFC veteran, Cole Miller. How are you doing, Cole Miller? Doing well. Uh, how's, how, how's everything uh, out in the real world right now? Where, where are you located right now? I'm in Warner Robins, Georgia. Uh, it's dead center of the state, not near Atlanta. We're like, we're like two hours from everything. So two hours or two and a half roughly from like Savannah or the beach, like two hours from Alabama, two hours from Florida. Yeah. And then probably like we're two hours from Atlanta, but maybe like three hours from getting into Tennessee or the Carolinas. Gotcha. And you, you, were, you were raised in Georgia, right? You were born there? I was born in Augusta and was never raised there. I'm a military brat, so. Gotcha. Um, but where I'm at right now, I spent some a lot of time here. This is where my parents um, were. They went to high school and they grew up here. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool, cool things. And again, um, you're a, you're a veteran in the UFC. I mean, you were on the Ultimate Fire season. I think it was season five, correct? You were mm -hmm. with uh, Jens Pulver's team. Yeah, stuff like that. So, I mean, you had a stellar career. I loved watching you. You're one of my my fan favorites, and one of the the reasons why I liked you was your ground game was just um, unstoppable. I mean, your ground game was was crazy. I loved I loved watching it, especially someone who would um, would follow jujitsu and stuff like that. Some people just like to stand up, and that's you know their 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 most important thing is like they like watching brawls and stuff. But I, I loved. I love the ground game. The ground game was so nice to see the transitions, to see, you know, all the, all those, um, you know, turn out to play. So it's really cool. And I think you're one of the, the very best at, at the ground game. So I love watching Thank you. Appreciate it. No problem, buddy. So going through your, your career, when did, when did you start mixed martial arts? I started in the summer of 2003. Okay. Um, started training with a small team, uh, it was called the Academy of Fighting Arts back then. Um, uh, my trainer was Cam McCarg, and he lived in Griffin, which was maybe an hour, hour and a half from Macon, where I was training. But he, he we, we rented, like, a, a space inside, like, gyms and stuff. Okay. And so he, two days a week on Tuesday and Thursday, he'd come down and teach there. And then he had, like, this – at his first instructor's house, they had like this shed that was like modified into uh, like a little, a very small MMA gym. Okay. And that was like the Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So it was not conventional. Like how you see a lot of the people coming up now where there was like a lot of structure to the classes where you learn this art and that art. He was pretty much a self-taught guy. Okay. For the most part, he was really good. Gotcha. I mean, really good. Uh, he he could tap out <clears throat> he could tap out anybody so like his submission game was awesome like one of those guys that he trained like some wing chun or something but he was a like a gymnast pretty athletic guy for walking around at like 180 pounds and he fought at 170 oh wow but he he did was kind of incomplete but for the time he was very good and submissions were his specialty so gotcha. he could catch you anywhere i mean like black belts so mm -hmm. it was not like it wasn't like oh he was just good compared just, to yeah. the guys that knew nothing that he was training he was very good um and he would you know back in the day compete in grappling and and uh you know tap guys you know fresh off off the, the plane ride from brazil so, <laughs> i mean he was a very talented martial artist and uh he was ahead of his time in many ways, but I trained with those guys in summer of 2003. And, um, that's like where I got my start. And I started just training like the two days a week. And uh -huh. then I, as I got like into it and hooked, which I already knew I'd be hooked when I went. Uh -huh. Um, I started driving to Griffin and we kind of trained a little bit more hardcore, I guess up there because we were, you know, we were in that little shed and it was either hot in the summer or, you know, you could see your breath in the winter. Yeah. And, um, it was, it was nasty, but like I said, it was not structured. We didn't, you know, show up to a class and learn and drill. And then at the very end, maybe get some rolls or some sparring. It was, mm -hmm. all right, what do you guys want to learn today? If nobody spoke up. It's like, let's just get to work. 
this kid's and he got there and the train was like 7 30 and it was done when you were done like this instructor he was like i said he was uh he was all different so he like had had hours like a, a vampire he stayed up all night and like went to bed at like six in the morning and oh, he'd man. wake up you know I don't know, 2 p.m. or something like that. And just do it again. They started and go again. So it was nothing for us to stay till midnight. Or, I mean, sometimes we'd stay till 1.30 or 2, but, like, it would be no nothing for you to be there till midnight training. But that's, like, five hours or four and a half hours of sparring. You, of course, you, like, take your break. You go sit off on the side, do your 10-minute recovery, drinking bullshit. That's, like, what happens at all the schools. But, yeah. I mean – you got to work. That was what we did there. Gotcha, man. And uh, what motivated, what made you want to start uh, mixed martial arts? Was there anything? To... I saw UFC 1. Okay. When I was, like, live on the cable box. Oh, wow. And so I thought it was cool. And so we followed it the whole time. And it's like a family thing. Like, my brother, my dad, me, my granddad, we, we'd watch these things. Or if uh, – there was not one happening for a while. You go to Blockbuster and you pick up the VHS of a one that you already saw. Yeah. Man. So it was stuff we were into. We were we were just into stuff that kids in my time were into, like Mike Tyson's boxing, you know, like, like the era, you know, uh, GI Joes and uh, Ninja Turtles and Power Rangers and pro wrestling and Van Damme and Seagal. Like wherever yeah. you look, there was that type of thing. Um, was I feel like there was like fewer things for boys to be into and it was all that type of thing so that's how I got into it I guess gotcha um, watched it all the way through and then I had heard about this place and I was in my cop like freshman year of college and I was, I was 19 and I was just like yeah that's something that I know about already and I would like to do um I already knew I wanted to fight, you know, without even like really knowing what it was. Of course, I'd seen it. I was a fan of it. I've been exposed to it. I was watching Pride. I was watching UFC. I knew what Pancras and Shuro and King of Zest. The and I already knew about this stuff. It wasn't in, in 2003. It wasn't, this was not foreign to me. Um, okay. So I already knew a little bit about fighting. It was not good. But I knew what it was. And I knew when I went to this place that I already – that was something I wanted to do. Got you, got you. And um, after that, your first uh, amateur fight, can you go through a little bit of that? How, how did that go – how did that pan out? How did that go for you? Yeah, I did amateur fights for uh, a year and a half, roughly. Okay. Um, I fought ten fights. Uh, the amateur fights just meant you didn't get paid back then. Yep. So the gloves were the four ounce gloves. There was no shin guards. There was no um, money. That was it. And the, the, the guys, I'll be honest, like the skills were less, but you did the same things the pros did, like in Georgia, because it was the commissions were not involved. Okay. Um, we had like an independent sanctioning body, the ISCF ran mo most of the events in Georgia. And um, that was just to have some kind of regulation. I think we didn't do elbows in Georgia, but I fought in states where as an amateur that they did, you know, where we did, we did it all. In Georgia, you had a four minute round instead of a five minute round. But I fought in states where you did a five minute round. Like, so I never fought in these rules that these guys are doing today. Um, and that's like when sometimes people will say like, oh yeah, you, you were 21 and 10 or, uh, and, and won the contest or whatever my pro record is. I literally don't even know mm -hmm. because I know I fought like 45, 47 times. Like I that's how I did it. We didn't, there was no difference other than the exchange of funds when I was coming up. Like I started in summer of 03, I fought in November of 03. And I fought, like I said, 10 times in a year and a half. And I had like a surgery or two surgeries in that time also. So like I was, the volume was high. Gotcha. We trained at a high pace. We fought as often as possible. And that's like what we did. Gotcha. 
And I mean, now now you see now you see them because back in the day, I mean, you got paid because I've talked to a couple fighters and and uh, we were discussing. It was Chris Lytle was actually I was talking to, and he was saying how um, it's kind of it's rough to see, especially uh, the older fighters that you know fought back in the day, still trying to fight and and make some money just because he was saying is the money wasn't there back in the day, and now. He sees what the the fighters are getting paid now, and it's it's um it's almost like they 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 want to get that money, but it's it's hard because there's I, I mean there's so much going on. There's so much different fighters now. Before it was um it was either you're a jujitsu guy or you're you know stand up. I mean now everyone's so well diverse. It's pretty crazy. And he was just saying um just about that about how how many um, fighters are coming out. Young, like older fighters, like Chuck Liddell was fighting, you know, Randy Couture at a certain point where he was still fighting and stuff. And it was just because he said the money was too good. I mean, that was his his opinion again. But um, I would say the money is not good. I okay. would say that these guys are coming back because it was good compared to what they were making before. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's right. not the same thing as good. Okay. Okay. Because like these guys feel like they missed out. You know, like they, that's, what they're was, the ones that's basically that, what he's saying. So these guys paved the way up to a point where now these guys can get these new guys can be compensated. Yep. And now because these guys have a little bit of fight left in them, they're trying to fight to kind of almost like get paid what they deserved. Yep. I think that's what he was going for. I think I just reworded reword, it bad, but yeah, exactly yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Because so. they're not getting paid good now. Mm hmm. I mean, look, look what's happening. I mean, with the UFC, there's, you know, fighter holdouts and stuff like that. And I know um, you had uh, a couple run, you know, situations with the UFC as well in the past. And we'll, we can uh, dive into that as well. Um, I've talked to Mark Hunt before. Um, I talked to a couple fighters who um, almost have the same um, mindset, not a mindset, but um, same agreement with the UFC, just not treating the fighters uh very well that is the organization i mean mark hunt went on one went on a tear uh jamie bother oh, yeah on he uh he was uh not happy with the usc as well just um but mark hunt was i think the most the one that was speaking out the most because i think yeah was, he was super vocal and remember there was a few years ago where those guys like cerrone and dillashaw and gsp and uh those guys were coming out and they were, um, excuse me, they were uh, doing the PFA, the Professional Fighters Association. I mm -hmm. think that was the one. And then, like, they were talking about how they, oh, Tim Kennedy was involved in that and they were going to, like, come out and help uh, these fighters and kind of form, it wasn't a union, it was an association. But mm -hmm. when you think of it, just consider it that for people less educated on the differences between the two. Yeah. Um, and they were going to come in and, like, collectively fight for the fighters. Then Randy Couture and, like, Kung Lee and uh, some of those guys from AKA, I can't remember if it was, like, Swick or Fitch or maybe I'm wrong on those guys, but uh, some guys from AKA were part of this other one. Um, and I think that they have a suit going on right now, and, and they went and talked in front of Congress. And then there was another one that got started later um, – I can't remember the name of that, but that was, how long ago was that? That was like six, seven years six, ago. Seven years ago, I think. Yep. You know, and then, um, and then Mark Hunt coming out and saying some stuff and then, uh, and recently Maz Vidal came out and, and spoke up. Yep. It's like Mark Hunt and Maz Vidal. Now I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that they're making way more money than somebody like me was making like a mid-level fighter. Mm-hmm. So if those guys feel that way, imagine how somebody like me was feeling or imagine how some of these guys that are on the, you know, coming in making the eight and eight or whatever. Gotcha. And then those guys that are out there grinding, getting the surgeries, like I mentioned, for free and or, or fighting for $300 a show and 300 to win. You know, think about that. Like yeah. before it's like, and I know fans that were like, man, I wish these guys would just shut up and quit complaining. If you think that you're worth more, then uh, maybe you should have um, 
maybe you should have just held out held out for what yeah like so for them to just say or somebody just say no or go go elsewhere it's like yeah like where where are you gonna go well how that's... much more could you make and if you think and they're like i just wish these guys would stop complaining but now when the higher level guys come out it's different now it's people different. are like oh yep. oh oh connor does a fake retirement it's like the smart people can read between the lines. Yeah. Nobody just, I'm not talking about the recent one or, or whatever. I'm talking about like, he like dipped out in the middle of the talks with like the Nate Diaz rematch or maybe that was wrong and I'm talking about a different fight, but like, he'll just like retire. Come on. The guy's clearly doing that as a, like a leverage. Yep, he is. To get more money behind the scenes. He just wasn't coming out and saying it. Or you can't tell me that, you know, there are lots of fighters that, fight for their value and they 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 compromise we all compromise in life but i just like can't stand the, the fans that just say i wish these guys would shut up like dude you don't even know what we're putting our bodies through yeah. our families through ourselves through to make like 84 cents an hour for the work we put in gotcha you know so like i don't i don't want to hear it but, but now that you got these guys that people love that are big time big big time big time saying some stuff and i think that it, it resonates more when somebody like uh or a mazudal who's the baddest motherfucker on the planet you know coming out and uh you know uh talking about how he is not making what he deserves yeah man um again a, the, a lot of people don't see um they're very close minded with, with certain things, man. They, they really don't see the, the work, you know, you guys put in. And even after the fight, I always remember talking to Jamie Vonner about, you know, his fights after because he would get in some brawls. I mean, obviously you did too. And just that feeling after, you know, like there's so much that goes into it. You know, obviously you have to go, you know, to the medical, you know, this, they're like, oh, they get paid this. But yeah, but, you know, what about the medical bills and stuff? What about and the time off? Yeah, like, the time you know, off. Oh, exactly. You made this much in one night. Well, no. First off, you know, you got you, everybody knows how you got to pay bills. Like you got to pay your team, you got to pay your manager, mm -hmm. you had to pay for your equipment, you had to pay for that specialized meal plan that you had in that camp. You know, of course, you just got to pay your all normal bills. That's like in your training camp, you know, leading up to that moment. So now, and taxes, you got to pay taxes on that money too. And then, then, like, let's say you made 20 grand. You're like, you made 20 grand in 15 minutes? It's like, no, nah, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> I made 20 grand in eight years of this shit. Yeah. 20 grand in eight years. Like, that's like all this stuff up until the point is what we're talking about here. Yeah. And then, and then after that, you got, oh, I broke a hand. So now you're like, oh, now this guy can't work for six more months. Exactly. He can't work for half a year. So that 20 grand is probably sitting at 10 grand right now. So you have that 10 grand that really went toward the bills for the last two months. And then it's got to make you last six months. So yeah, and it, people it, will say 20 grand in four minutes. Like, no, no, not 20 grand in four minutes. And again, and that's where people, uh, people get confused, I guess. And they, they think something else, man. And again, I, I heard that argument before, like, Oh, they got paid for one night. I mean, I wish I'd get paid for one night doing that. And again, that's why I try to have these podcasts. That's why I try to have some fighters on just to get a, a good perspective for people to actually like see what goes behind closed doors. Because again, a lot of people, you know, love the UFC, think they're the greatest, but you know, again, behind closed doors, I mean, it's a business, right? It's um, the fighters are the greatest. Exactly. So the fighters um, are the greatest. So that that's that's something I always wanted to, you know, talk major about. league baseball that's is not the greatest. The NHL is not the greatest. The players are the greatest. Yep. And that's that's something that, you know, every company needs. And they know it. They know it. And that's why, um, again, all these fighters are coming out now, like you said, that, you know, they're big time. So now. I wish these guys would have spoke up years ago before it was cool. Yep. And um, what you eating there? <laughs> Bacon, egg, and cheese. My, my croissant. Oh, nice, nice. All right, I mean, okay, so going back, okay, when we could 
talk all day on this, but let, let's let's like highlight a little bit of your career. So once once you got in the UFC, man, how was how was the Ultimate Fighter? By the way, I, I, I asked someone before. I asked Chris Lytle. He was obviously in the Ultimate Fighter comeback, and then you you came right after. What would you what did you think about that? I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't really remember a whole lot. I never had a good memory to begin with. And um, I think that most of my memories are like hazy or still pictures. I don't have like a video memory. That's fine. And most of my memories come from either one, me watching it, or two, people telling me what they saw when they watched it. It's not like, I don't know. I mean, like I remember, first off, the guys were great. So it was cool to be involved on like such an experience mm -hmm. where I met some really cool people and made some good friends and learned a lot, you know? So it was like a good like experience, like life experience. I remember that at like a young age. Um, and then uh, I'm going to tell you, most of us were miserable. Like we, we had each other to like have a good time and talk and stuff like that. But um, we were, outside a lot at night by the fire and we would we would hear those planes going from like the las vegas Karen <laughs> airport and we go man i wish we were on that you know going back home that was basically how it was every night really now good people good times but like dude i don't i remember a few things that happened that were really like cool or funny or, mm -hmm. or something but i don't um I don't have this like vivid memory. I mean, and I'm, I'm 36, man. And, uh, that was 2007, January of 2007. Yes, sir. When I got on the ultimate fighter. It was 13 years ago. <laughs> and, and just, it, it's grown so much since that, man. It's, it's crazy. Um, yeah. again, you made your, your official UFC debut against, uh, who was the gentleman was Andy Wang. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you beat him first round. How was that feeling? Do you remember any of the feelings? Do you, is there a certain fight, like fight that kind of like you still remember or anything like that, that kind of pops in your mind? Like, oh man, that, that was a good battle or man, that was, you know. I, I don't remember the feeling. Like I can like feel that feeling or recreate that feeling, but I remember it was a big deal. It was a very big deal. Um, like when I fought Andy Wang, I had like negative three hundred and fifty-seven dollars overdraft in my oh, bank wow. account. So, I mean, like, so I ended up making my eight and eight. I got a knock out of that, which was fifteen. So I made thirty-one that night. That was a big deal, really big deal. And so, um, being able to, to do that, and then also knowing what that meant moving forward actually receiving a contract with the UFC, um, that was very important. Gotcha. So that was, that was a fight where, again, I can't like picture how I felt, but I remember, I remember obviously it was a big deal. Yeah, I got you. And how, how was the contract? What did the contract look like? Was there, because I know like, most of the fights, the contracts. The way, the way it was then, it was a year, a year system, not, per fight. So for your first 12 months, it was eight and eight, 10 and 10 for the next year and 12 and 12 for the third year. That was for those that did not win the ultimate mm -hmm. fighter. That was your ultimate fighter UFC contract. Okay. okay. Three year. Okay. Yeah. And, um, cause now, now, now that it's different, the contract's way different, right? It's, it's with fights. Like they, they do more about fights than anything. Right. Like, I don't think the Ultimate Fighters exist now, so. Yeah, they are. Right? They do the contender, but the contender is just like a gateway. Like, it's just, you fight. You don't you don't get a reality TV um, thing built Explosion around you. And stuff like that. It was a different time. Really yeah. different time. Yeah, definitely. And, um, again, it was uh, it was good. I, I loved watching. I, I liked watching Ultimate Fighter. But then it got a little, there was too much then. After that, it was, there was too many. Too many Ultimate Fighters. I think I stopped after after season five. Maybe I saw yeah, – They did two a year, two a year, right. you know, and then it just keeps building and building. And um, 
I think that that's why they, they're not doing it anymore. You got to milk it till it's dry, right? That's true. Like that's, how, that's always how it's got to get done. So they, there was a time where reality TV was like a really big deal. And for them to be able to introduce the public to the fighters, because personally, I don't care because I'm already a fan when I'm watching MMA. I don't care if this guy's a good person, if he's funny, if he's educated, uh, if he's got a family. I don't care. You know, I really don't. I watch fighting for the fights and the techniques. Yep. And I'm a very small uh, piece of the, the MMA fan population. Like, I don't watch the UFC to see good people. I don't care. I want to see the best fighter in the world fight the second best fighter in the world, or I want to see the 15th best fighter in the world fight the fourth best fighter in the world. And I want to watch these guys fight so I can see what they do, so I can, like, kind of watch, and I can, I can get excited about this. And that's, that's it. I don't, you know, this day and era, everybody wants to know who these people are. They want to expose um, who they are. They're very in touch with who they are because of social media and things like that. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying I'm not into that. I don't care. But right. the ultimate fighter was there to get people into that so that they would watch. Yeah. And that, and it worked and it worked for so long. And then, by the time that, that they're obviously ended the show, um, people are, it's here now. It had to be like it was so it could be here now. And now that it's here, people can just watch the fights mm -hmm. because they're fans of MMA now. There's, we don't have this weird, like, we need to be accepted so we can be mainstream, so there can be more money, so these fighters can make more money. Like this doesn't happen now. We're here. We got fighters or uh, fighters' names being mentioned in, in mainstream rap songs, and you've got all the um, Hollywood people going to the fights, and so we don't yeah. need yeah. reality TV yeah. anymore. And that's not that's not something that's even in like the culture here. I I don't think I might be wrong, but like in other other uh, areas, I think that that kind of it was here, and then it's kind of gone. Yeah, definitely. Um... Again, uh, do, do you watch any any other uh, MMA organizations? Like you said, you like just watching um, just um, the fights, you know, like the competition. I mean, you have belts, yeah. or you have one championship. I mean, you got a bunch. I'll of tell you what, I I love uh, the Ryzen or Risen, however you say it. That's my favorite. It is. I, you I, know, it's kind of like a pride throwback. Yep. Um, they don't have the stack of fighters that you know Pride once had, or Shudo, or you know, a lot of these guys back in the day is what I'm talking about. They have good, great fighters, okay? But I'm talking about the abundance, right? Because yeah. now that there's more organizations, there's more organizations that have some of those fighters, right? So it's mostly Japanese, mostly. Yeah. For the most um, but I like watching Ryzen the most. Uh, okay. Champ Kyoji Horiguchi, American top team fighter. He's a... Uh, I think that he could go down as one of the, the greatest of all time at flyweight. Cool. Possibly. There you go. It's, it's very, it's very likely. He is, he's phenomenal. And he's Bellator champ too. So he went over and got the Bellator title. So I do watch the or other organizations, not quite as frequent. I like watching some of these other shows too. Like uh, if, one thing that I really like is UFC fight pass. Um, because I can watch Muay Thai fights and I can watch there's so much um, yeah there's so much content and uh, there's some grappling events too like some like EBIs and things like that so I watch as much as I can or as much as I can be interested in um, and it, when I have like, like friends and teammates that are fighting when you're part of the the biggest um, team in the world naturally there's people you know fighting all the time so I, I try to tune in for that too. Like I want to see how Dustin Poirier is going to be doing against Dan Hooker. Yep. You know, like three weeks ago, uh, three and a half, whatever. It was a battle. I was down man. there training with uh, Maz Vidal, and I got to train with Poirier, and I got to train with Tiago Moises, and and uh, my brother Micah, and Charlie Decca, and, and upcomers like Cody Law, and uh, and I'm working with these guys, and so of course when. Uh, Poirier fights Hooker. Of course, I'll tune in. You know, like Definitely. 
I, you, you said I'm, you helped I'm, you helped I'm them out, right? Yes. I'm sorry. You, you, you said you helped them out because of, of your uh, physique. Yeah, body type. I yep. love, I'm like Dan Hooker, right? Yep. So I'm six foot tall and lanky, and tall, long, long, and I can throw kicks well, you know, like Muay Thai style kicks, and 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 he has a good guillotine, and I have a good guillotine. So we we, we worked, you know, it makes sense. Yeah. But I've no these are people I've known for a decade. Of course, I'll I tune in, you know, so. I turn, tune in for the technical aspect, and I tune in to watch the people who I know and love that I want to see win. Definitely. Um, so I'll watch whatever organization I have access to. Uh, mostly the UFC, of course. Like, they're, they're the biggest. And, um, but the, everything that I can find on Fight Pass, I, I watch. It's, it's fun. Um, I can see some of these guys coming up, and I can always learn. So um, there's some good stuff on – uh, flow combat sometimes and okay. you know there's some, one one uh championship mm -hmm. is, i like one championship like dude they're one. great yeah they're great yeah. you know so I, I, wa I watch what i can when i can definitely so here, here's a million dollar question all right is there anyone any fighter out there that you are willing to maybe uh get out of retirement and fight by any chance maybe like a a Conor McGregor well, that you never never got the chance to to fight him. <laughs> well, I've never I've never retired, oh, so okay. I'm inactive. Is what I tell people. That's perfect. Um, I'm I'm looking at coming back this year. I only, my plan was to take one year off. Okay. Okay, and that was in December of 16. So right at 17, mm -hmm. I want to take a year off. Um, I got my academy started so I can like have something that would not make me uh, hate martial arts you know because yeah. you're sometimes you get too close to things when you're training for fights all the time it can make you hate this shit mm -hmm. so i i didn't want to hate it so i needed a break mentally physically um financially so it's not that funny i financially needed to take a break i needed to not have a job fighting in order to make more money isn't that crazy i'm trying to say that to you is it that crazy yeah so um, I got my academy set up and then my, um, I tore my labrum. So, uh, in my shoulder I had to have that redone, um, and, and had that done. That's kind of like a longer recovery. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then once I kind of got chill, chill, I was like, I'll come back when I feel like coming back. So okay. it feels like the time is right. I was supposed to fight in October of last year. Okay. Um, and the promoter dropped the ball, like, seven weeks out from the fight like and I was, I was ramped up i was in great shape ready to go um so it's not all, all on me like i'm trying to make this thing happen and gotcha. you we were talking about money you think that fighting on like a smaller show is making me any money yeah i get you i'm trying to fight for charity right now like i don't mean charity like they're paying me pennies i mean like i'm literally trying to like attach myself to a charity and fight for charity because like that's not something that I'm willing to do is just go fight for 500 bucks, but I will generate as much money as possible to try to push toward, um, you know, a, a good cause. Definitely, man. So we'll, we'll see about a return, you know, um, maybe end of this year. Uh, I have some talks going on. All right. Uh, and that's awesome, man. Uh, hopefully, you know, you have, you know, you come back cause I'll be, more than more than excited for you to come back and, and and watch you again man again i know you've been active and stuff like that and now you have a you have a gym in uh georgia and stuff and i mean you stay active and that that's awesome and again i'm i'm excited whenever you get back in the cage man just remember man there, there's a bunch of people that uh care about you and, and love watching you man hell yeah appreciate it so uh, again, uh, I do appreciate you taking just a little bit, you know, of time out of your day just to hang out and just talk, man. Um, um, again, I'm a big fan, big supporter of Cole, uh, Cole Miller, and uh, just keep doing what you're doing, brother, all right? Yeah, we'll have to do this again when hey, I get something ramped up. Yeah, man, whenever you want, man, we can do, you know, whatever you want. We can do a live stream and, and watch the fight and stuff. I, I know I was watching the – I mean, unfortunately, it didn't go – Mazadal's way. I, I'm originally I lived in Miami, so I did American Top Team over there for a little oh, cool. bit. Yeah, well, this was when um, this was in Doral, 
Remember there yeah, the was old, the American the old ATT and Doral, yeah. Yep, and then they closed that down. So I was there at that time. Um and I mean I had a good good time and stuff and we we're, we're really close those people over there. But other than that, man, um so I really was shooting for uh, Mazdal to win and again it was six days notice and I mean Usman don't give you know Usman's a beast I mean he did what he he had to do to win you know unfortunately yeah I mean look we saw what happened and Masvidal still the BMF yeah. like he went out there trying to to throw bombs to fit, finish the fight and we saw what Usman did he put the pressure on you like you said he did what he needed to do to win yeah and um good on him yeah you good know. on him a lot a lot it's of people all, it's all good. Like his, a lot of people don't like that style um but again hey it's um it works for him i mean it's not the the sexiest thing to look at you know watching someone just but at the same time uh, hey i mean yeah i mean but like look masvidal got outpointed and that that was it he didn't get hurt the only cuts he had were from two accidental um headbutts which that's yeah. that's fine you know but, like, other than that, he, he didn't get touched up at all. So, I know what Masvidal is going to do. He's going to go back. They're going to mop up on some fools. He'll come back in good shape. And he'll get, like, a real fight that's scheduled for him to do a, a real training camp where they will pay him what he asked for instead of dicking him along the whole time. Cut him that check. Let him know that he's good to go. They won't be, like, squandering over finances for, uh, you know, weeks and then tell him that the – fights going to somebody else only to bring him back yeah. and give him what he asked for. Now that he, they saw the, the star power, the drawn power of what he can do. So now he showed his value. So he'll yep. go up, dust off on somebody, come back up and uh, we're, we're going to see him fight for the title again. Definitely. Yeah. He'll, he'll be back in them. And then one thing I love about him is that he, he, there's a lot, some fighters that come out after they lose and stuff and make excuses. Oh, I was hurt during their training camp, this and that. He didn't. He said, man, he played his – he was just a better man. He just – he did what he needed to do, and he won. And there's and he said there's no excuses. So I, I love that about him. Again, um, he's Cuban. I'm Cuban. I like him a little bit more than, you know, just, just being a little bit biased. But, I mean, it is what it is, man. He's, a, he's an awesome guy. You hadn't heard him say it? I'm not Cuban. I'm American. He says <laughs> yeah. it all the time. He all says time. it all the time. Mm -hmm. But you, you can Unfortunately, the, the Cuban just comes out of him naturally. He, his, the way he talks, man, it's just. just oh, yeah. <laughs> but I love it. I love it. He, you can tell, you know, straight up from Miami. It's, it's awesome. But we'll, we'll eventually, again, we'll, we'll do this again sometime. Maybe, maybe when it'll be, uh, when he goes for the rematch, man, maybe we'll go live. We'll do something. We'll. We'll definitely keep in uh, contact, man. Cool. All right, cool. Again, thank you so much, brother. You got it. Hey, have a good one, man.